Welcome to Learning Machine Seminars at Rice. Today's speaker is Ebba Ekblom, who is working as a researcher at Rice, and she's focusing her, her research on generative, net, uh, generative adversarial networks and federated learning. Uh, she defended her master thesis in uh, last spring, uh, focusing on also on generative adversarial networks, but for uh, microwave data for stroke detection. So. Without further ado, I will hand over the word to you, Ebba. Yes, thank you, Olaf. Okay, so hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ebba, and I am working, as Olaf said, as a junior researcher here at RICE, um, currently doing research on GANs in federated learning. Uh, so that's what this presentation will be about today. And this will mainly be an overview of the field. I'll be introducing some of the current methods, uh, some of the challenges that still exist. And finally, I will also be mentioning a bit about our and the future research that could be made on this topic. So, but let's get started with just federated learning and what that is, and perhaps most importantly, why we need it. Because Today, in our relatively modern society, we generate huge amounts of data uh, every day. We track ourselves, uh, we track our businesses, our industries, and a lot of other things as well. And ideally, we would use this data uh, to improve our lives in some way. And that's where machine learning comes into the picture, because uh, this has proven to be a technology that is capable of using data for a wide variety of purposes. However, a lot of the data that we generate can be considered to be private. Uh, and due to privacy concerns, we might be hesitant to share uh, data about ourselves or about our businesses or whatever it is. Oh, sorry, there is something wrong with my uh, presentation. Now, uh, yeah, so we might be hesitant to share this data. And since machine learning models are often very dependent on large amounts of data to perform well, uh, and in contrast, training many separate models on smaller local data sets would probably yield much worse results this becomes a bit of a problem uh, when we try to gather data. So what do we do about it? Well, in 2016, a researcher named McMahon uh, proposed a learning framework called federated learning to overcome this issue. <clears throat> and the idea is to create a training procedure that benefits from models that are trained on many private local data sets without the need to actually share the data. And to do this, we start with a global model on a central server. A copy of this model is then sent out to a group of clients, each with its own uh, private local data set. Each client then uh, trains the model they received on their own data. And after all the clients have trained their copy of the model for some time, it is sent back to the server where all the models are aggregated in some way uh, to form a central uh, global model. This model is then sent out to all the clients for training again, and this way it continues until training is completed. Uh, so at the end, we have a central model that has been trained on a large amount of data, but the actual data has never left the clients, which is exactly what we wanted. <clears throat> I'd like to mention a little about the aggregation of these models. And the most common way to do it is by federated averaging. And this corresponds to minimizing the average of the objectives of all the local models. So in this equation here, uh, the local loss function of client i is represented by 
Fi, uh, depending on the weights W. And as you can see, we get the global objective F of W by computing the average over the N clients. Averaging can um, be considered a relatively simple approach that could, and it actually does work pretty well for many scenarios, uh, but in others, it might not. It might be a bit too naive, especially when the data distributions on the different clients are very different to one another. And that is what we call the non-IID or non-identically distributed uh, data. We have reason to believe that the different models uh, when trained on very different types of data become quite different during the local training. And then simply averaging these might not lead to a model that captures meaningful representations of the data. But what actually is a good way to aggregate the models is a topic of research, uh, an ongoing uh, topic of research. And at the moment, averaging does actually seem to be uh, quite good in many situations. But what the best way is probably depends on many factors, including what type of data you have, the network and the purpose of the model, uh, and also, of course, the data distribution. <clears throat> Since this talk is supposed to focus on GANs, I will go through a few different approaches that are specific for GANs uh, a bit later. <clears throat> Before moving on to talk about GANs, though, I would like to just add that although federated learning allows for data to stay local, it is actually not a guarantee for privacy. There are some studies that show that it is possible to reverse engineer from gradients uh, or the weights of the network uh, to find out what data the network was trained on. There are also some methods to counteract this, uh, including differential privacy, where noise is added to the gradient before aggregation. Uh, but this is also an ongoing field of research that me needs more understanding. Uh, and it will not be the focus of this presentation, but I do think it's an important thing to just keep in mind when talking about federated learning. <clears throat> So then, let's move on to GANs. Yes, uh, GANs, or Generative Adversarial Networks, uh, were first introduced in 2014 uh, by Ian Goodfellow. And these are deep generative models, uh, and perhaps what we're most used to see them generating is images. For instance, we have these incredibly realistic uh, portraits of people uh, that look like real photographs, but these images here are, of course, generated by GAN. Uh, and the GAN that generated them has, of course, improved a lot since the first formulation in 2014. But since it all builds upon the same principle still, uh, I will be focusing on the original formulation here. And the GAN actually consists of two networks. We have a generator and we have a discriminator. And in the first step, we feed noise or data from a random distribution into the generator, which then outputs a sample. Uh, let's say it's an image. An image. Uh, images from the generator are then fed into the discriminator together with real uh, images from an existing data set. And the goal of the discriminator then is to distinguish, distinguish between which are real and which are fake. And based on the output of the discriminator, we can compute a loss that we can use to feedback uh, through both the networks and update the network weights. And this will guide the generator to, in the next iteration, uh, generate data that is 
a bit more like the real data, but it will also guide the discriminator to be better at identifying what is real and what is fake. So this way, the training of GANs is often considered to be a two-player game, since the discriminator and the generator have opposing objectives. And the goal is to reach a point where the generator can generate images that are indistinguishable from the real ones. And in theory, we reach this point of convergence when the discriminator no longer can make this discrimination, assuming that we have an optimal discriminator, that is a discriminator that is really good. However, in practice, unfortunately, this can be quite hard to obtain. Um, and GANs are known to be relatively unstable and suffer from a range of problems during training. This includes the discriminating overfitting uh, to the data set uh, and only recognizing exact copies of the samples in the data set as real samples. We also have something called mode collapse of the generator when the generator only generates one type of mode or one type of sample, um, when in reality, what we, re what we really want is for it to capture the entire distribution of data. And finally, another problematic phenomena uh, is something called vanishing gradients, which happens when the discriminator becomes too good, too fast, or too early on in the training. And the loss will then become too small uh, to make the generator do meaningful updates. And this will lead to the generator not actually learning anything uh, at all or very little. <clears throat> so how do we do then to train these models using federated learning? As opposed to other machine learning models, we need to federate two networks that work very tightly together. Uh, and on top of that, we have these qu quite unstable models and it's perhaps a bit uncertain how they behave when the data on each local client, um, when the amount of data on each local client becomes small. And although these questions aren't perhaps completely answered yet, uh, there are definitely some attempts at doing this. And one of the first attempts that got some breakthrough was called the MD GAN or multi discriminator GAN. The idea was that since it's only the discriminators that actually require access to a real data set, it's only the discriminators that has to be placed on the clients, while the generator can be kept central at the server. So this is what they did. And it is illustrated in this figure. And as you can see here, one training iteration consists of the gener generator first sending generated images or samples of uh, some type to the clients, uh, where the discriminators perform one training iteration, one update of the local discriminators. And then they feed back the loss from based on the generated samples. All the losses from the local discriminators are aggregated by averaging before updating the central generator. So in some sense, we simulate and aggregate the discriminator before doing the update. However, uh, since the actual discriminators never are aggregated, there is a risk of them overfitting to the local data sets. Uh, and to counteract that, the authors of MDGAN added this extra features of discriminator swapping uh, between clients occasionally during training. And of course, since this was one of the first approaches, there are definitely some pros and some cons of this. <clears throat> first off, by keeping the generator central, less compute is made on the clients. 
And in the paper, they consider this to be an advantage, but I'd say that in reality, it actually depends on where we have the most um, computational power, which in some scenarios might actually be on the clients, and then it would be beneficial to perhaps do the update of the generator there as well. Secondly, uh, sending data in each training iteration will get costly quite fast as we increase the number of clients. Uh, and also when we start working with data of higher dimensionality. And lastly, this implementation does actually not take any consideration to when data is non-IID distributed across clients. Uh, so there is actually no theoretical guarantee of convergence for non-IID data. And in reality, this is often the case. Uh, the data on different clients is very different depending on the client. So we need some adaptation to be able to handle that scenario. And that will lead us on to the next paper. But first I'll just mention a bit about uh, what non-IID data actually is. Uh, and actually it can mean a lot of different things uh, and probably in combination. Uh, but the type of non-IID data that we are considering here is what we call a label skew. And that is when the category of samples uh, differ on different clients. For instance, when one client could have images of apples and another could have images of bananas, that is what we would call a non-IID setting. So the question is, how can we learn a central model when each client has different types of data? And the goal is, of course, to have a model that can capture the entire global distribution where all classes or categories are well represented and if you look at the figure here to the right, this is represented by Pmax uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, that clearly is made up of the union of P1 and P2 from the top, where P1 and P2 have uh, different types of fruits in their uh, distributions of data. And in reality, we can imagine that this is quite common as well. Let's say, for example, if we have a dog owner, perhaps this person have images of dogs on its phone, whereas a cat owner uh, would have images of cats. Uh, but of course, it's usually more complex than that as well. But how to deal with this scenario then when we train GANs? And one approach that has been made uh, is called the Forgive First Update. <clears throat> and in this paper, they still use the same structure as MDGAN with only discriminators on the clients, and the generator is kept central at the server. But instead of aggregating the discriminator losses before updating the generator, they only use the most forgiving one, and that is the discriminator that gives the highest probability of generated samples being real. And by doing this, they prove in the paper that the global minimum of the generator's objective becomes P max, which is the distribution that contains all classes in the data that we want to achieve. On the other hand, you can imagine that it's quite inefficient to only use one discriminator in every update, since we utilize much less information to do the update. And to handle this um, case, the authors suggest another approach to use in practice, and that comes down to a trade-off actually between efficiency and performance. And this they call forgive a first aggregation instead. 
uh, yes, so instead of using just one discriminator for each uh, generator update, they do actually aggregate them, uh, but they put more emphasis on the ones that are more forgiving. So instead of just normal averaging, uh, the discriminators are weighted according to how forgiving they are. Do you see something popping up on the screen? Because <laughs> nothing happens for me. Uh, no, it it seems to be frozen. Seems to have frozen, yeah. We see the slide on the when data is non IID in practice. Yeah. Uh, and two bullet points. Oops. Now we have co located. Here we go. Now you now see have, an equation. We have the equation, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, this is the, the equation that is used to aggregate the client discriminators di here and as you see they are weighted with this s lambda uh, so s lambda is the weight and it is computed with the softmax function and the softmax function is a normalization of the exponential of the discriminator outputs and the normalization comes from, from the summing the sum of the exponentials at the bottom uh, and the purpose is to exaggerate uh, higher values. That is the most forgiving discriminators. We have a lambda in this equation as well, and that is used to adapt this approach because when lambda is zero, this actually corresponds to normal federated averaging. But when lambda is high, this would converge towards uh, using only the most forgiving discriminator. And what value to use here for lambda probably needs to be adapted to each use case and is depending on how non-IID data the data actually is, uh, but would need to be adapted for each individual uh, case. But to conclude, this approach actually manages to capture the non-IID distribution, uh, but is still very communication heavy uh, because of the need to send data between the generator and the discriminator, especially when we only use one discriminator for doing the update. So we are gonna turn to some other ideas, namely ones that co-locate the generator on the clients. And the first perhaps naive approach would be to compute federated averaging for both a generator and a discriminator that has been placed on the clients. And there are studies that show that this works even for non-IID settings. Uh, but I think we have reason to believe that we can do better due to the very simplicity of this approach. And there was actually another recent one called Fegan uh, that uses metadata to make more informed aggregation. So before training starts, uh, all the clients here share metadata about their local data set, such as the number of samples per class and the total number of samples and so on. Then at the server, they compute the divergence of each local data distribution with respect to the global data distribution that is represented by the metadata from all the clients. This divergence is computed with a callback library divergence, but we can just consider it to be a measure of similarity between the different distributions. Um, And based on this similarity, then they give each client a score, um, which is the product of the callback library divergence and the fraction of data that is found on that specific client. 
so we have if we have n k data points on client k and n data points points in total, this would be the score for client k. And from this score, we then give each client a weight, which once again is normalized using the softmax function. Uh, but as you can see, this time we use a negative score in the softmax function. And the purpose of this is to penalize clients whose distribution of data is very different to the global distribution. And that is because these clients are considered to be less important. On top of this, they also sample a subset of all clients in each round of training. And the clients are chosen uh, according to some criteria uh, based on the metadata in order to form a balanced uh, data set in each round that is representative of the global distribution. They also favor clients that have not taken part in training before in order to continually introduce new information uh, during training. And all in all, with this approach, they managed to get quite good results. Uh, they beat normal federated averaging uh, of the generator and the discriminator. But however, we have now taken a step away from privacy uh, when we share this metadata about our local data sets. And to me, this can definitely be considered a drawback of this approach. So despite good results, I'd say that there are still some unanswered questions. And more specifically, uh, that is whether we can co-locate the generator on the clients to decrease communication, but still making informed updates without violating privacy and also generating high quality data. And this is basically the main question that we've been looking into uh, during our work. And in, in particular, we've been looking into when the data across clients is non-IID distributed. And to start, I will show you some comparisons that we've made on different models. So in our experiments that I present here, we are made on the data set CIFAR 10. This is an image data set consisting of 10 different object classes, uh, including things like dogs, cats, airplanes, trucks, I think, and similar objects. Uh, we have 100 clients with two classes each, which gives us this non-IID setting since most clients will have different classes of objects in their data sets. And we use the FID score to evaluate our models, which is a relatively common measure for GAN performance. It measures the quality of generated data and also the variability in the data. So having many images of the same thing would result in a worse FID score. And the goal is to have as a FID score that is as low as possible. And as expected, you can see that MDGAN struggled quite a bit to learn something in this non-IID setting. Uh, we compare this to the federated averaging, uh, which performs much better, even though the data is non-IID distributed. But even better though is the last approach here, which is from a Wasserstein GAN, uh, but still using federated averaging. And this is one kind of improvement that's been made on GANs since they were introduced in 2014. Uh, and it is used to counteract mode collapse of centrally trained GANs. And what we find is that this uh, transferred very well to the federated setting. And overall, I think it's an interesting direction to take to federate even more um, complex GANs, for instance, or more modern ones, um, and see how they transfer to the federated setting where uh, we have much fewer data points on each local client. 
But while we're on the topic of mode collapse, um, we have another quite interesting result that I'm going to share uh, from our experiments. And it's this one. Uh, these are the outputs of a gun that's been trained on the Celebe, Celeba uh, dataset, which consists of facial images of celebrities. And um, as you can see, the results are really bad. Um, many of the images are firstly very similar to one another, indicating some sort of mode collapse, um, but they're also of really bad quality. Uh, so, but when we trained this GAN, the exact same architecture in a federated setting uh, using federated learning, we got these results. And although this is from a very simple architecture and the images are definitely not perfect, the improvement is quite clear. So even though there are definitely challenges in how to do when we federate GANs and it could and the load the small data sets on the clients can be a challenge. Uh, this is an indication that there can be advantages of uh, train federatedly as well. But I think we definitely need to do more research to actually understand why this is, uh, when it happens, and why it happens. But that was it for me today. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I will try to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Eba. Do we have some questions from the audience? Uh, I can start. Uh, I, I think this this final slide is is really interesting. Um, do you do you have some intuition or some ideas on, mm -hmm. on why why does this why why does this happen? Why why is it uh, that when we're not changing anything but but introducing federation, yeah. uh, we get better results? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um... I guess it comes down to the averaging of the models um, and somehow that introduces uh, some, um, perhaps it stirs up what the, the model is doing and whether it disrupts information or whether it contributes with information that's perhaps a bit uncertain, but maybe by doing that averaging, we make the models take another direction uh, in some way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it would. It's interesting to find out why this happens. So adding some stochasticity to the process. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple questions in the chat as well. Um, are there any requirements with these methods to have access to all clients simultaneously, or can clients come and go over time? Asks Jock Jakob. Uh... I, I think you have to either Jakob will have to clarify or you you just assume what he means with with these methods. I can clarify if it's confusing. Um, so, so this means let's say you have um, learning taking place on cell phones or on vehicles or on machines, uh, then they, these will come online and come offline and be part of a learning of a training population, or whatever we should call it. Um, each of these will have their own bias. Um, the bias will change over time. Presumably, we're doing some kind of long term learning strategy here. Um, so, how would this affect the behavior? I think? Yeah, uh, I think this is done in federated learning in general, uh, that this is something that is being studied, ha having this varying group of clients. Uh, I have not seen much of it for guns specifically, but I don't think there would be any, any hindrance in doing so. Um, but I, I have not, I don't think I've actually seen it for guns, but I think it should be possible. Have you seen anything related to topic drift in guns? Sorry? To topic drift, uh, concept drift and uh, guns. So you have the, the notion of a cat changes over time. Uh, no, I haven't. Not in uh, federated learning. Um, 
but that would be interesting to do, I think. And probably very related to reality as well. Uh, so Jesper has a question. Yeah, um, it's kind of a continuation of your question, Olof, with respect to this, why uh, uh, federated learning se seems to, in some settings, work better. I, I wonder if there is some similarity or relation to, uh, for instance, uh, asynchronous AC3 in reinforcement learning, where they showed that by training multiple agents in parallel, the models actually converged faster than if you would run the same number of episode, uh, episodes, but in serially, uh, the model tended to converge faster. Uh, and I think in that paper, they argued that they could uh, uh, avoid, uh, or rather, if we put it in this setting, maybe it's about avoiding mode collapse by doing breath search before kind of depth first searches. So maybe that added stochasticity is kind of similar to that uh, distributed learning paradigm as well. Yeah. I, I don't know if you have any in, intuition or any, any additional thoughts, but um, it, it seems kind of similar in some sense, but at the same time, it's, it's not the same thing, but maybe similar. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a very interesting perspective. Uh, maybe there is something we can learn from reinforcement learning here. Uh, yeah. I'm not too familiar with it, but um, it sounds uh, like it could be something similar, yeah. yeah. I think in that original paper, at least in terms of uh, synchronous a uh, asynchronous AC3, I don't think they had any <coughs> convergence proofs. They just observed that it, it did converge faster than expected. Uh, um, but, but maybe there are additional papers after that trying to look at it from a theoretical perspective. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, interesting. Was there any other question? Um, with the method that, that uh, the, the Fagan method, uh, you talked about transferring metadata to the server and sort of limiting the privacy aspects. Um, what kind of metadata do they transfer? And, and The metadata, I think, consisted of what classes existed on, um, on that client, um, uh, how many samples of each class, and also how many samples in total they have. Uh, I'm not sure if there was more information that was shared, but I'm certain that these were shared at least. Mm. So it's it's on a quite uh, high level. Uh, it, it's not very detailed information about the data then. No, no, no. Um, one could say that, yeah. Mm. Um, but I guess in some sense it could still indicate, for instance, interests that a specific client have. If we, if we go back to the example of somebody having images of dogs on their phone, uh, that could be an indication of some interest that that person has, even though we don't see the actual images. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Certainly. But on the other hand, they get quite good results. So, I mean, perhaps it's a trade-off of uh, privacy and performance. Hmm. Absolutely. Do we have some more questions? Maybe, uh, maybe one. If nobody else has one, um, and I'm, I, I'm not sure how to uh, even structure my question because it's so uh, ill posed on my part. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think uh, a few years ago, there was another uh, presentation on guns from uh, Edwin. And at that time, uh, I, again, very, uh, very un abstractly went into the direction of uh, um, invariants and invariance risk minimization from, from Leon Boutot, where they tried to learn uh, 
robust models uh, against invariance, uh, basically uh, trying to be, I mean, on a very high level, essentially what they do is that they, uh, instead of uh, uh, kind of randomly merging data sets, they keep data sets separately and then they train, um, they train on each sub data set individually and then they kind of measure the distribution of differences between the data sets. And then they use the assumption that if there is a distributional data set, uh, uh, if, sorry, if there is a distributional shift in the data set, then that shift is an indication of a spurious correlation. So they try to kind of eliminate that difference of um, those differences of, of the distribution between the data sets as a way to kind of learn more robust features. <clears throat> That's like the very weird way to explain it. But um, uh, I wonder if there would, would be some relation also to federated learning in the sense that each, each client here does possess its own kind of very skewed uh, data set. And if there would be some gain in actually uh, trying to eliminate that, that skewness between, between clients. And, and by that way, actually learning more robust models that is more generalizable between clients. <clears throat> so, so my question is, does it, yeah, uh, does, I guess that's the problem. I don't, I don't even know what the question is, but uh, I mean, does it make sense or have you seen anything similar in terms of those discussions? I don't think I have. Um, it sounds like an interesting uh, thing though. Uh, I'm not sure I followed. Do you mean to change the distribution at the clients or to understand no. basically the skew? Yeah, yeah, understanding the differences between mm, the clients. Yeah. So again, you would be breaking the, the privacy uh, question uh, unless you're able to somehow measure the skewness towards like uh, some mean data set or something. Um, I, I guess that could be one way of not sharing that information between clients, but um, but yeah, I mean, the yeah. idea would be to, to kind of uh, compare differences between the, the data sets in any case. Yeah, it would be very interesting to have a way of computing these differences and understanding them that is very anonymous, uh, that doesn't involve sharing information to a server perhaps. Uh, but I don't think there's any existing uh, method for this for GANs uh, at least, but it no. sounds interesting. Yeah, I mean, it would be more related, I guess, to, uh, to just federated learning in general, mm -hmm. not specifically to, to GANs. Yeah. But the paper from Leon Boto is called uh, Invariance Risk Minimization, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. We'll have to look that up. Yep. All right. So uh, sorry for a very confusing question. No worries. It was interesting. So I think we have a question from Andrea. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's just a short question, Ebba. Uh, you said that you have two kinds of data, ID and non-ID, and uh, that you've tried to, in your approach, to use one of the two to move the generator towards the client side, if I understood correctly. Uh, and you said we're not used, we've not used the other one. Is it because it's a trivial case or why? Is it less interesting? I'm just Maybe I, I missed a point there. Do you mean on this slide when I said that we focused on the non-IID? Data. Yeah, exactly. So I understood that of what you presented, then you decided to use only half of it. Or... Uh, yeah, I, I would say that having IID data becomes much more similar to having training a gun uh, centrally. Uh, and it's quite unrealistic to have that in reality as well. In reality, data is often non-IID across clients. Uh, for example, different people are different uh, and therefore have different information or data uh, on their phones so whatever we use. Uh, and that's why the non-IID data case is more interesting, perhaps. Does that answer your question? 
Well, yes, certainly. Okay. No, I get it. It's more towards reality. So real yes. cases. Okay, good. Yeah. Not theoretically. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eba. Uh, next week, we welcome Arman Rahbar from Chalmers University. Um, he's going to talk about online learning of decision trees. And uh, the week after that, uh, December 16th, uh, we have Stefan Dascoli uh, from Facebook AI Research uh, in Paris. Uh, he's going to talk about double descent, uh, insights from the random feature model. Uh, and then we have a break for, for Christmas and come back in January 13th. So see you next week. <laughs>